The key is to recognize that, that you're a hero in your own epic story. If someone has a positive mindset or even a negative mindset, let's just talk about like in an organization, could that have a ripple effect on, on other people around you? Oh, big time. I mean, energy is, is contagious. One man or one person can make a team, but one person can break a team. Is there a common trait that you see amongst the great leaders that you encounter? They create oneness, they create connection. I mean, I work with Dabo Sweeney, Sean McVay, Eric Spolster of the Miami Heat. Eric is all about focusing on creating a great culture, getting his team to be one team, focused on one mission, one goal, all working together. The minute you think you've arrived at the door of greatness, it will get slammed in your face. So it's being humble and hungry and always learning, growing, and improving. Hi, and welcome to Common Denominator, a podcast about growth, mindset, and entrepreneurship. I'm Moshe Popak, and today I chat with John Gordon. John's a best-selling author and speaker on the topics of leadership, culture, sales, and teamwork. His principles have been implemented by Fortune 500 companies, pro and college sports teams, school districts, hospitals, and nonprofits. He's been featured on The Today Show, CNN, Fox and & Friends, and more. And his books include the timeless classic, The Energy Bus, The Carpenter, Training Camp, The Power of Positive Leadership, The Power of a Positive Team, and his latest, The One Truth. Simply put, John's an expert in developing positive leaders, organizations, and teams. Hi, John, and welcome to Common Denominator. Moshe, great to be with you. Why do you think, and I know it's very important to you, John, why do you think that mindset is super important to all humans? Well, it's something that I learned in my own journey. I was miserable, negative, unhappy. I was making my wife miserable because I was so negative, and I lost my job during the dot-com crash. And so I didn't have a very positive mindset. And losing that job, I was blaming my wife for why I had not lived up to my potential, why I didn't live up to my dreams. And she had enough of my negativity. She said, if, if you don't change, we're over. And so she was going to leave me. And I wanted to be more positive. I didn't like who I had become. I didn't like how I was living in terms of fear and stress and anxiety and crumbling from the inside out. And so when she gave me that ultimatum, it was like this incredible wake up call. And I said, okay, what am I born to do? Why am I here? And why am I so miserable? And one, writing and speaking came to me in that moment. I'll never forget writing and speaking. I'm going to do that. I don't know how, I don't know in what way, but it just came to me. And then it was like, how could I be more positive? So I started to research all the ways that I could be more positive. And this was during the emerging field of positive psychology. So I read you can't be stressed and thankful at the same time. So now every day I'm taking these walks of gratitude and I'm not feeling stressed. I'm feeling blessed. I'm feeling good. And I don't know this, but years later I know I'm flooding my brain and body with these positive emotions that are uplifting me instead of the stress hormones that are slowly draining me. And I'm also creating a fertile mind that is ready for great things to happen. And so I'm changing my mindset day in and day out. And so the thoughts we think and the words we say become the reality and the life that we live. Like that's how important thoughts are. We are more thought beings than physical beings because we're energy. And so our thoughts of, of who we are, of what we believe, our perspective, and how we see the world determines the world that we see. And so I know mindset is everything. And there's one piece of advice I think is great to start with. It's from Dr. James Gills. He was the only person on the planet to complete six double Ironman triathlons. That's a double Ironman, which means you do an Ironman, and then a day later, you do another one. And the last time he did it, he was 59 years old. And he was asked how he did it. And he said, I've learned to talk to myself instead of listen to myself. He said, if I listen, I hear all the fear, the negativity, the doubt, all the reasons why I can't finish this race. But if I talk to myself, 
I could feed myself with the words and the encouragement that I need to keep on moving forward. And I've learned over the years since that advice, since the feeling blessed instead of stressed, the success journal, and all of the practices that I actually brought into my own life. And now I teach to others, world-class athletes, the most successful sports teams, the, the highest level CEOs. I get to work with all these incredible leaders and businesses and sports teams and organizations. You get to see this play out, but talk to yourself instead of listening to yourself. That affects your mindset and that creates a whole new perspective and it creates your life and your world in a very positive way. I really love that uh, idea of talk to yourself because I remember um, a friend of mine told me how many times up to the age of 18 because we're programmed, our subconscious, from when we're born in those early years of life. How many times have you heard the word no compared to the word yes? Mm. So if you know that we're just like a computer program, right? So we're a blank slate when we're born, and then you just programmed, it's fear, it's not possible, negative. So if you know that and you're a logical being, then, then what you need to do is exactly your point. In other words, see it, see the fear, see the negative thing, it's not gonna work out, because fine, you could do that your whole life, and you have one life, and that's it, and it's finished. Or, right, like you said, slowly, even though it's exhausting in the beginning probably, but write it down, positive words, and you see slowly over time, it'll, fl it'll flood out or negate the negative thoughts, let's put it that way. Yeah. That's what, that's what it's, I've it's, seen. Oh, totally, and it's not, that it's hard, it's just that you're not used to it. You've been programmed for so long mm. towards the negative. It's like you get into that car and that playlist or that station is what's on. And so you're used to hearing that playlist, that station. And a lot of time it's negative programming. Here's the thing, this is revolutionary. And I talked about this in my new book, The One Truth. The brain is an antenna. It's not like an antenna, it actually, is an antenna. You have 86 billion neurons in your brain. Every neuron has a transmitter and receiver. And there are two main frequencies that you're tuning into, a positive frequency or a negative frequency. Two major ones. That's why everything in life comes down to positive and negative in this world, because those are the two main frequencies. One frequency calls you to less, one calls you to more. One lies to you and tells you you're not enough. The other one calls you to your hopes and your dreams and what is possible. And so once you understand the brain is an antenna, it's actually the hardware, there's this internet cloud of consciousness, of software, and thoughts are always coming in. People say thoughts come from the subconscious, not initially. Thoughts come initially from this internet cloud. And what is the subconscious anyway? I've asked people to identify where the subconscious is. Tell me where you have found the subconscious. It's actually the soul. We are a mind and a soul. And the mind is not the brain. Brain is different. Mind and soul are the software. And the brain is, again, that hardware. And then there's this cloud. And what happens is those negative thoughts are always coming in. And I've asked neuroscientists, no one has ever found a thought inside of a brain. So these negative thoughts from that negative frequency are always coming in. And what happens is they're lies. And they lie to us. And they tell us things about ourself and our future that are just not true. And then we believe the lies and then we reinforce it. And then we speak it out loud. And then we actually feel guilt and shame for the thoughts that we have. And we beat ourselves up for those thoughts that you didn't choose in the first place. See, the thoughts come in and now you're beating your, yourself up for those thoughts. The key is to recognize that, that you're a hero in your own epic story. Everyone is. And the hero must overcome what on their journey? A villain, mm -hmm. negativity with positivity to create their future. And once you realize this, now you say, okay, I don't have to believe those lies. I don't have to listen to those negative thoughts. What I've realized is on my journey of life is I believed them, then they became a part of my soul and my pattern because I've actually adopted them. And now I am choosing those thoughts. But you don't have the power of the first thought. Remember that, it comes in. But you do have the power of the second thought. And this is revolutionary. This is saving lives, this one teaching. I've been teaching this to so many young people now who are struggling because a lot of my executives and people I work with and successful coaches and you name it, they're like, hey, will you talk to my son? Will you talk to my daughter? 
And I teach them this. And I'm telling you, it has saved lives. One was suicidal. He was in the ER two nights before. And once he understood that his negative thoughts were not coming from him, and he stopped beating himself up, and he stopped feeling broken, thinking something was wrong with him, that he needed to be fixed. Once he realized it was a battle, and he could win the battle of his mind by talking to himself, instead of listening to those negative thoughts, by speaking truth to those lies, everything changed. The next day his parents said, what did you do? He's fine. They couldn't believe it. I said, I just shared the truth with him. Reached out to him just the other day. Again, this is now a year and a half later. How you doing? Doing great, Mr. Gordon. High state of mind. Instead of that lower state of mind, lower frequency, positive is a higher frequency. I know I was reading the other day, you talk about the youth. Gen Z's are more anxious, ages, I guess, 12 to 27, more lonely, more anxious, uh, maybe more guilt, not, not feeling uh, valuable, more than any other generation. So, you know, these, I, these ideas, you know, maybe it's from social media, maybe it's from other places that they're getting, um, uh, you know, the, the, these ideas from, but um, it's extremely important to put in practice, daily practice, uh, those ideas. But if someone has a positive mindset or even a negative mindset, let's just talk about like in an organization, could that have a ripple effect on, on other people around you? Oh, big time. I mean, energy is, is contagious. One man or one person can make a team, but one person can break a team. I call those people energy vampires. Mm. And they could suck the life out of the energy in the room, in the organization, on the team. And so often, negative people will sabotage your culture, your team. And so I work with a lot of professional and college sports teams. And you could see how this plays out on a team. Like, is that person positive? Or are they negative? Are they selfish or are they selfless? Are they a me person or a we person? What's their focus? And you can see how their negativity could be contagious and sabotage a team. Pessimists do not change the world and pessimism is contagious. So we have to guard against pessimism on teams and really fuel up and feed the positive and the optimism. Going back though, I want to I want to address what you just said because I think it's really important that you said the younger generation is really feeling divided, they're feeling separate. These folks, these these young people are really struggling. Maybe it's social media. Here's what I wrote in the one truth, and this is the key: once you realize it's an antenna, when you move from oneness to separateness, you move from positive to negative. Everything in this world comes down to oneness and separateness. What do I mean by that? The root for the Greek word of anxious means to separate and divide. So when you feel anxious, you actually feel separate and divided. All mental health disorders report feelings of isolation, mm. disconnection, feeling separate. We use terms like bipolar, separation, schizophrenia, split mind. A narcissist actually feels separate. And because they've, in many cases, dealt with trauma or experienced trauma in their life, that's why they're a narcissist. They're focused on themselves, not others, because they feel separate. So now it's about themselves and their own survival. If they felt one and connected to others, they would care more about you. And if you study the brain of a narcissist, there's actually a neurological separation where one part of the brain is cut off from the other part. There's a neurological separation that's a manifestation of this spiritual or soulful separation that they actually experience that then leads to that neurological separation. And in studying narcissists, this is also key. Mm. I'm like, okay, I'm writing this book. I'm studying narcissists to understand this. I said, well, if my theory is correct that everything comes down to oneness and separateness, I bet narcissists actually suffer from mental health disorders like bipolar and depression. And sure enough, increasingly they do. They suffer from all different types of mental health disorders as a result of that. Because when you move from oneness to separateness, you move from positive to negative. So what is social media doing? Is it really social media? We can't blame social media. It's actually the separation that exists. It's the fact that when the pandemic happened, yeah. people felt isolated and disconnected. And that led to more negativity and fear and anxiety because there was a separation. What social media does do is reinforce the separateness that you actually feel. And it hits you 
over and over again with that message that you are separate. You think you're connecting with more people, but you're actually feeling more and more separate and unqualified and less than as a result of what you're seeing on social media. But if I show up to social media and I'm feeling good and I have my purpose and I have my mission and I look at social media and I'm in a high state of mind, it will have no effect on me whatsoever. It will have no power over me because I'm one, I'm connected. And when you are one in your high state of mind, the circumstance doesn't affect you. When you're in a low state of mind feeling separate, the circumstance now affects you. It's never the circumstance though. One day you're in traffic and I know you're in South Florida. One day you're in traffic and it bothers you. The next day you're in the same traffic and it doesn't. Is it the traffic making you feel a certain way? No. If it was a traffic, you'd feel the same way every single time. And the traffic would cause everyone to feel the same way. The fact that one day you're in a good mood, another day you're not, it shows you it's always your state of mind. It's never the circumstance. So it's not social media. It's our states of mind right now in this world and how we're letting the circumstance affect us because we think it has power over us. The minute I teach kids, you have power over your circumstance. Social media does not have power over you. It cannot define you. And I teach them how to go about social media where it doesn't. It's incredible how they are able to rise above it. But I think for parents, what I'm actually seeing functionally on kind of like on the macro level, definitely everything you're saying, but right. So I saw an article, 13 hours, average human in front of some sort of screen each yep. day. Uh, remote work is more and more popular. So we're not right when we're together with another human, right? We're feeding off each other, Actually. like you're saying. Um, uh, households, it used to be man, woman, child. So the family unit was 70% in America a generation, I mean, in 1950 years ago. Today, it's only 17%, um, right? So, and then we're moving less and less with um, organized religion. So that'll, not that that's good or bad, but less community. So yep. all of these things just functionally, right? So you're this young kid coming out into the world, right? It's like, okay, and we're talking about that oneness, how, right? So people are yearning for that. When I, I have a farm, and I, and, I, and I speak to, you know, I can have business meetings and things that are going on. And then when I mentioned, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to the farm. I'm going to go on, you know, we have these horses and they have chickens and cows. That's all they want to talk about. Like any meeting I'm in, people, completely to your point, people just want to connect. And that oneness is more than ever before. We were made for connection. We were made for oneness. We were made for relationship. And when you pull people from that, you start to see mental health suffer. But when you move people towards connection and community, then you find wholeness and you actually find healing. Relational psychology says we heal in a loving relationship. Well, at work, you can have a loving relationship when you're working together and caring about someone. When you come together as a group of men and you're getting together, watching a game even, or hanging out and talking, there's a connection that happens. Addiction programs, the success of addiction programs or the fact that people feel separate. And so they're filling that hole in their soul and that separation with a drug or some substance or something that's trying to make them feel better because they're actually seeking that connection and wholeness feeling. When they remove the drugs now, they remove the substance, they replace it with community. They replace it with connection. They replace it with a higher power. So you move away from self and you move towards connection and community, and that starts to heal the person, and that's where we see progress. When you work also, uh, I know you mentioned you work with many sports teams and business organizations. Is there, uh, is there a common trait that you see amongst the great leaders that you encounter? Big time. They create oneness. They create connection. I mean, I work with Dabo Sweeney, Sean McVay, Eric Spolster of the Miami Heat. Mm -hmm. Eric is all about focusing on creating a great culture, getting his team to be one team, focused on one mission, one goal, all working together. So there's an understanding of that. So they create great cultures. They also lead with optimism and belief. They are positive leaders. They know that you win in the mind first. So they're really big on themselves in terms of investing in their own mindset to better lead their teams. You can't be a great leader if you don't have a positive mindset. A positive leader becomes a great leader. So if you want to be a great leader, you got to work on your mindset that helps you have more resilience, more grit. You got to be able to feed yourself 
in order to feed others. And leadership is a transfer of belief. So you believe, but you got to get your team to believe. And you got to overcome a lot of adversity and challenges and negativity and rejection along the way as a leader. So that optimism and belief, they're essential. And then what I see really as like the crux, as what I'm really bringing to the forefront a lot now these days is the idea of love and accountability. Like you got to love your team. They got to know you care about them. Again, creating that relationship and oneness, but you got to hold them accountable to the culture, the values, the principles, and the standards that you have for your organization, your company, your team, your school, whatever it may be. So we know the values, we have the standards, and I'm going to lead you and I'm going to support you, but I'm also going to hold you accountable because I believe in you and I got to call you up sometimes to greatness. I got to call you up because I know that you're not giving your best. And if I really care about you, I'm not gonna let you settle for anything but your best. And if I care about my team and this company, I gotta make sure that you're contributing to everyone else's goals and mission. It took me a long time to understand exactly to that, to that point. I was talking to somebody about this the other day. A real friend is, you know, if you have dirt on your face, is gonna say, by the way, you got dirt on your face. That's a, that's a real friend. Uh, it took me a long, long time to really understand that because we're so used to, you know, you want to be around people that make you feel good, but that's not real. What's real is real. That's real, right? You know? Yeah, I love that. A real friend will, will tell you what you need to know in order to get better, and they'll tell you when you're not reaching your potential or giving your best effort. We call that difficult conversations. Right. Great teams deal with the elephant in the room and they have difficult conversations. And the goal is that you have them so often they don't become difficult anymore. And that's actually a new book I have coming out in the spring with my colleague, Amy Kelly. It's called Difficult Conversations Don't Have to Be Difficult. And it's about how leaders can have conversations with their team in order to improve and get better. And it actually brings the team closer, not further apart. Because I know uh, even, it's always like things that, um, you know, you have a kind of like a gut check that make you uncomfortable. I know as, when, as I was, um, you know, it, I guess even in my marriage, there would be these tough conversations and it was always stuff that I need to work on. So I'd shut down. So, but as you, as you progress, you just kind of just have to stand there and really, and really be open to it and think well, about yeah. it. You gotta be willing to get better. And that was me. My wife one day said, you need to be a better dad. And I wanted to respond, oh yeah? You need to be a better mom. Here's what you could do. But instead, I didn't. And I said, okay, make me better. I'm open. Right. I'm willing. I, and then several hours later, she was done telling me what I could do to improve. <laughs> and uh, I took the advice. It wasn't several hours. It was about like, you know, maybe half an hour. But I listened to those ideas and I implemented them. And I did get better and I was willing to get better. Uh, and I love that. Unfortunately, I try to think of if there's a shortcut, I always call that the rock bottom at that mm. point, right? Your marriage was super important to you, right? So you're like, okay, either we stay married or we get divorced. And you're like, you know what? This is important to me. I'm going to shine the light on me. And I'm actually not going to, you know, fuss around. I'm actually going to be honest about it. And I'm going to take the action steps. Mm. That's the accountability point, right? But why That's do we have we to wait? wait? Yeah, yeah, why do we have to wait, Moshe? Why do we have to wait till we hit rock bottom? That's what I always wonder. I know. That's, well, that's, that in, uh, on the show, I'm trying, like, I'm literally, like, talking to myself. Like, I literally talking to myself to try to figure out ways how to, this is hopefully a way to give back to other people that they can learn, okay, I got smashed a million times, and then, okay, this is the lessons that I've learned. Hopefully, maybe you'll take it, maybe you won't, and uh, it'll hopefully help you avoid uh, having to go through that yourself. That's, that's kind of like the, the idea, but I'm super impressed by the way, uh, 28 books and counting. Uh, how do you, um, first of all, just logistically, I guess you have a knack for writing books and, and probably gems. I mean, I've read some of, some of your stuff. What would you say is from all the books you've written from where you are today, what are the top two or three points that, mm that you'd say really you live by as like your Bible type of thing? It, the Energy Bus is the most popular book. It sold 3 million copies and it's actually my first book. And I didn't even know I could write, to be honest. It was one of those things where 
I got the idea to walk one day. It was a gratitude walk. Mm-hmm. And the idea came. And I just said, okay, I'm going to write this book. And I wrote it in three and a half weeks, rejected by over 30 publishers. Mm-hmm. Eventually it got published. Took five years for it to be a bestseller. And now it's had the success that it has had. Wyndham Clark talked about how it helped him win his first PGA Tour championship. He won well Wells Fargo before winning the U.S. Open. And I just had him on my podcast. Travis Kelsey talked about it actually, mm. you know, uh, before the Super Bowl, like a couple of weeks before, talking about how it was one of the first books he read. His coach made him read it, all this kind of stuff. So I didn't even know I could write a book. But but writing is something where, yeah, I, I consider myself a writer. I get the idea. It takes me about three and a half weeks to four tops to write the book. And I'll write the book. And then from there, I've got two more coming out. So now I'll have 30 books out, 15 bestsellers, which I'm really thankful for that people are, you know, are reading them and they're getting out there. But if I had to boil it down to like a couple of major themes, one would be the carpenter, which is love, serve, and care. I just love that message of that book. Love, serve, care. If you really want to grow your business, don't focus on building your business. Focus on loving, serving, and caring. And if you do that, your business will exponentially grow. And that's what I've done in my life. I love people. I love what I get to do. And I love others. And I I just love this work. So I love it. I serve others. I'm here to serve and impact and make a difference. Of course, we're business. We want to make money. We need to make money. But the intention behind it all is to serve, knowing that I'm going to die one day, but how can I impact and leave a legacy? And then it's care. Like you really do become great by caring more. The difference between average and greatness is is caring. Like seeing yourself as a craftsman, not a carpenter. A carpenter shows up to build something, but the craftsman is someone who is here to create a work of art. They're here to produce excellence. And I want my best work to, my, my sorry, my next work to be my best work. I want to always improve. So the one truth people are saying is my best book. I just got a note from Bob Rosenblum today, one of my friends who I don't even know Bob Rosenblum read many of my books. And he said, I really believe the one truth will go down as one of the, as the best self-help and life lesson book of all time. And I'm like, wow, Bob, that's that's really thankful. But I really think it's that kind of book and will have that kind of impact. So I know my my latest work is my best. And I already got ideas for the next ones. So I want to improve that. So love, serve, care. I would say energy bus in terms of positivity, that your positive energy must be greater than all the negativity. That's a key right there because every one of us will face negativity, but you have to be more positive than the negativity that you face. And so that's a really you know, big lesson I, I live by. And then I would say Training Camp, which is my favorite book I've written. And I would say Training Camp is all about pursuing excellence, overcoming your fear, finding your faith to become all that you're meant to be, and then producing and pursuing excellence each day. So I'm pursuing it, I'm producing it, and, I, and I'm going after it. I, I continually want to get better, improve, and grow. The minute you think you've arrived at the door of greatness, it will get slammed in your face. So it's being humble and hungry and always learning, growing, and improving. And so that's my motto. That's what I live by. And I really feel like the best is yet to come. I really, I really love that. I mean, how do we, how do you get employees, really say like maybe over 85% of employees go to work and they're not too happy, right? You talk about love, love what you do. Can that be transformed? Can you, can you do that? Um, it seems it seems a little a little hard. No, you totally can. It's really about the leader and the team, and it's about the leader. Again, we have a number of leaders in companies, so mm. there might be a direct report, and that direct report has a manager. Maybe they're not the top leader, but they have a manager. And research and all the studies from Gallup show that that relationship between the manager. And the employee is crucial to the engagement of that employee and the happiness of that employee. Do I feel like I have a best friend at work? Do I feel like my manager cares about me? Is there a growth track in this company where my manager is concerned about my growth? It all comes down to relationship and communication. So if I start to communicate with you, it's the four C's. I communicate. I connect. I commit. I show I care. This is from the power of positive leadership and the power of a positive team. 
two books I've written. If you focus on that as a leader and as a team, you're going to improve engagement and your relationships and people are going to enjoy their work a whole lot more. Now, you got to still be doing something that you enjoy and love. That's a part of it in terms of you're not just you know, checking boxes every day, but you feel like what you're doing matters. So there's a purpose element there as well. But everything I write about, all the work we do, we have a day of development event where people, it's a public event and people come in and we address three things, mindset, leadership, and teamwork. And we go through all these principles and practices and strategies and exercises for a day of development. And people come and they leave a better manager, a better leader, a better team member, a better performer, a better father, a better mother. It's really cool because those three things are, are the keys. Leadership, mindset, and teamwork. You focus on those things and they're skills and you can develop them. And when you do, we see teams transform. And I work with a lot of the teams that have transformed and you see it and you know it could happen. Snapchat is one of my clients and Evan Spiegel brought me in to do a, a talk to his leadership team back in 2018 when they were really struggling and they had just read The Power of Positive Leadership. He brought me in to speak and they turned around their company with positive leadership. I had him on my podcast and he talked about how positivity changed him as a leader and changed his team by implementing these principles and practices, and then all of a sudden took off during the pandemic. So this is not theory. This is not Pollyanna. This is not just a nice way to lead. This is not about ignoring reality. It's okay to say this is hard, this is difficult, and this is challenging, but it's about maintaining optimism, belief, and faith in order to create a better reality. Right, I love that because I get that, I get that a lot. You know, obviously you see the cap, right? That's that's all I'm about, positivity. Love it. It's like, okay, you can't just, you can't just, you know, in the abstract. I honestly, I, you know, I have, I have 11 children. I have real wow. estate business. Yeah. A lot of things go on in my life. <laughs> and, um, and I'm constantly thinking exactly to your point, how can I still stay? It's a lot of struggles. There's a lot of stuff that goes on, right? Real stuff, like you say, live in this world. But, but can you glass half full or glass half empty? Each time, choice, as Viktor Frankl says, right? The only thing we have is our choice and our reaction. What is going to be my reaction? Could I pause and react with, a, with, a, with the right way um, even though you're exhausted and uh, you don't want to and all those things? But those things add up. It's that practical things. Because, yeah, who said life's going to be easy? Talk, right. right. Who said life's going to be easy? So how do you stay positive with 11 kids <laughs> and, and all that you have going on? And how, how did you, were you born in this country? Yeah. So I was born in, I was born in New York and, uh, we moved down to Miami 17 years ago and wow. my wife and I, I mean, we, uh, a lot of people don't know this. There was a point we had three kids and no job. Um, that was about 13 years ago and no family here in Florida. It's after the crash, after the financial crash. And, uh, and, um, and that's constantly, it was, you just, you just want good or bad or up or down. You just want to be alive and feel and, and live in gratitude. So you just, uh, the little, it's the little things. It's the little things that you just have to really appreciate that, that my wife and my kids are safe, right? Start with that, right? That you're okay. I had, um, I had a health issue for, for a couple months, uh, pretty, pretty bad actually. And, uh, and you just you just get clarity from that. You just you just get clarity, and people you know can complain and say things, but um, uh, just uh, you know just try to move forward with that with that right mindset. So I I agree, and I I resonate very much with that scene. I I picture it, um, you with your wife, and that scene. I resonate very much with that, and then your choice, and look where you are today, right? Yeah. So it's a really it's really amazing. I want it's your choice. Yes. It's your choice. It's, yeah, you said it's like I, I could look back, making that choice, taking those walks every day, yeah. being grateful, tuning into the positive. The brain's an antenna, T U N E, <laughs> tuning every day into the positive instead of the negative. Trust is the T, U is unite with love, yeah. N is neutralize the negativity, and E is elevating your thinking speaking truth to those lies and elevating your thinking, I am strong, I am healthy, I am powerful. You start to really speak that life into existence and then you become that. So every day I was doing that over the years, 
and it literally changed the course of my life. And I'm a completely different person now than I was then. I played lacrosse at Cornell University and my teammates cannot believe what I'm doing now because they're like, you were a wreck back in the day. Like you were a mental case and this is what you're doing now? Yes, because I've worked on my mindset. I've worked on my life. I've made the choices every day to think different, act different and be different. So I'm living proof that no matter where you are in your life, you can actually turn things around if you want to. Special, very, 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 um, you know, role model, you know, honestly, it's really, really good. What's something that comes to you right now that you're deeply grateful for? Mm. I am deeply grateful for just my wife and, and my kids. My daughter is now speaking. She's 25 years old. She's doing this work. So it's been cool to see her do it. I never thought she would. She was terrified of speaking, mm. full of fear. But now this is what her calling is. So she's doing it. So I'm grateful for that. And my son, who is 23, graduated from Clemson last year. He is doing a whole lot better. He really struggled during the pandemic. Mm. But now to see him go out there and he was doing some sales door to door, selling security alarms and learning how to sell, which is great. And now recently he's joined me selling for our certification. We now have a, a certification program where people can get certified to do what I do, to train, to teach, to do keynotes based on my three books, Positive Leadership, Positive Team and Energy Bus, Mindset and Leadership Teamwork. They can do workshops and training on that. And so we have a certification program and my son's now sort of leading that in many ways in terms of sales. And again, that was an accident how that happened. And so we basically got all these leads that came in because we posted one thing, not thinking, many would reach out and all of a sudden hundreds have reached out. So now we have to call everyone. I said, Cole, you're at home. You're, you're not doing the sales anymore. You want to do this? He's like, he's like, yeah, I'd love to. And he loves it. And I'm like thinking maybe this is part of the bigger plan that he'll probably run my company one day. It's amazing. And what's something, John, what's something about you that, that people don't know? Mm. God. What don't they know? I'm allergic, to, I'm allergic to chicken and eggs. So I, you know, you have a farm. I wish I could eat them, but I can't. So that's one thing. On, on a positive side, I actually love to dance. So I'll dance with my family a lot. And so my wife and I will just dance sometimes. So love to dance. Uh, I'm more fun than people think. So <laughs> that's probably something they don't know about me. And I um, you know, grew up in Long Island, New York. In a Jewish Italian family, a lot of food, a lot of a lot of guilt, and I would say my uh, my biological father left when I was a year old. So people may not know that. Single mom, married my dad, who raised me, you know, since I was five, and he was a New York City police officer, and so he raised me. So I, I would say people probably don't know that whole story as well. Yeah, I'm also former Long Island, so yeah, Strong Island. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I'm from Smithtown. Where are you from? So, uh, Lawrence, not too oh, far yeah, from yep. JFK, of course. Yeah. South Shore. South yeah, the the five towns. You five you grew towns. up in the you grew yeah. up in the nice area. I grew up in the in the hood of Long Island. Yeah, <laughs> the blue collar Long Island. There you go. But really, I um, I really I really appreciate it, uh, John. Really, um, hopefully, our conversation gives some some great energy to the audience and and ideas and thoughts uh, in a positive in a positive manner. How could people follow you on social? Uh, how can they get their books? How can they get your books and um, and be in touch with you? Yeah, just go to johngordon.com, J-O-N, gordon.com, Instagram, Twitter, at J-O-N, Gordon, 11. Had to add the 11 there because John Gordon was already taken, but J-O-N, Gordon, 11 on there. I'm always posting on LinkedIn as well. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. So any social media channel, you'll find that just by Googling me and also going to my website, johngordon.com. And I just do want to say, you know, as, as we close, I want to say that you're not meant to go through life fearful, anxious, worried, and chronically stressed all the time. It's become normalized. Yeah. So I think people actually feel like, oh, this is normal. No, it's not normal. We have forgotten who we're meant to be and how we're meant to live. You're meant to go through life with power, with peace, with joy, with courage, with confidence, and that's why I wrote The One Truth. So I really do hope people will read that book because it will impact your life. And I'm being bold because I know it's saving lives and impacting lives. And it's nothing like anything on the market. So I think it's going to really impact people. So 
I do want to say, I hope people read that book, One Truth, you know, and then you go to getonetruth.com, getonetruth.com, and you go there. We got a bunch of free resources for you to actually utilize when you get the book. Hope you enjoyed my conversation with John. Please subscribe to our YouTube page so you never miss an episode. And if you're currently listening to the show on Apple or Spotify, we'd be grateful for a five-star rating and review. Have a great day, and I'll talk to you again next week.